In December of 2020, I hopped onto Twitter to find that Mark Rober wanted to do a video together. Sounds good, I said. How hard could it be? Couldn't be that hard, right? If you haven't seen Mark's video yet, you should start there. This video is a technical deep dive that will make a lot more sense if you have some context. Specifically, we're going to talk about some of the really nerdy design choices we made on that first vehicle that attempted these egg drops. This is the vehicle with the movable fins at the back that we tried to do lots of fancy guidance and control stuff on. Mark wanted to do the world's highest egg drop, and the idea was that we'd bring the egg up to 100,000 feet, drop it, and then recover the egg like a normal egg drop, but just with a lot more feet in between the drop point and the landing point. If you're familiar with Mark Rubber, you know what an egg drop is, but the goal is to recover the egg safely on the ground without it cracking. Landing the egg safely has a couple of factors, so let's start from the ground up. The first is the landing pad. We calculated the egg's terminal velocity velocity on its own to be about 30 to 35 meters per second, which is a sporty 75 miles per hour. Our first idea with this project was to take a minor shortcut and have a 10 by 10 tiled mattress on the ground, or tiled foam pads. These foam pads were designed to soften the blow of the egg hitting them, and Mark was able to validate that the egg could withstand hitting them at its terminal velocity. So then the second question about landing the egg safely is how do you get it over that mattress? How do you get it over that landing pad? This one question has been on my mind for the last two years. So let's go way back and work out how to do this. First, we need to know where the egg is going to be at 100,000 feet and what the error margin is on that. To find this, we used a weather balloon simulation tool and calculated the regular dispersion of a balloon launched up to 100,000 feet over about a two hour flight time. We calculated these dispersions on a flight over the Bonneville salt flats from zero to 100,000 feet. And from what we could tell, the expected diversion was within about a kilometer of range. So let's say we let the balloon pass over that landing pad somewhere in that one kilometer corridor. Now we have to separate the egg and still guide it a little bit back to the pad. In order to stay true to the idea of what an egg drop should be, we wanted to keep the egg in free fall for most of the time, so that ruled out a plane or a glider. The good news is you can still steer cross range with rockets. If you use the body of the rocket as a lifting body, it certainly isn't very efficient, but it does work. And if you're the type of person who subscribes to this channel, then you've probably seen this happen online somewhere else. Five, four, three, Two, one, ignition, and liftoff of Falcon 9. Go Falcon, go Intelsat Galaxy 33 and 34. The Falcon 9 uses those grid fins up top to steer itself back to the landing zones or the drone ship, and my plan was to use the same approach here with a few changes. The first was to scale up an existing movable fin rocket I had. At the time, I was working on an air-launched rocket from a plane with steering fins at the aft. We opted for straight fins rather than grid fins because straight fins are a little bit easier to simulate. And when you design a new vehicle, it's important to give it a name. So this is the vehicle and it is called HARVER, which stands for High Altitude Reentry Vehicle for Egg Recovery. Love a good acronym. We scaled up the fin design to use two bearing attachment points so as to survive the high aero loads a little bit better. We haven't talked much about flight simulation, but I worked really closely with my buddy Joey to run a ton of simulation on how this vehicle was expected to move down through the atmosphere atmosphere. And to make it quick and to the point, if the vehicle doesn't have to divert too hard, we would pretty easily hit Mach 1 on the way down. Okay, zooming back out, we've got this set of fins, right? And we assume that somehow, we don't know how yet, these are going to be able to get us back to the landing pad. What happens then? After lots of simulation, we found a sweet spot of deploying the egg at roughly 300 feet or 100 meters above the ground. This is one of the coolest parts of the project to me. The egg can tolerate hitting the foam at about 35 meters per second, but the terminal velocity of Harvard above the landing pad is about 110 meters per second. That's like 270 miles an hour. The rocket is supposed to deploy chutes out the back to pull it away from the egg, which sits on the nose of the vehicle. But here's the thing. As soon as it does that, the egg is now traveling faster than its own terminal velocity. The egg isn't going to slow down to that terminal velocity immediately. So this whole thing becomes a trade-off of impact speed versus impact accuracy. We aren't going to dive too deep into the more egg-centric parts of the video. That's sort of on Mark's end. What I want to talk about in this video is aerodynamic simulation, those fins, and using a rocket as a lifting body. So how do you do fin control on a rocket? I am used to doing thrust vector control where you gimbal the motor at the bottom to steer the rocket. This is relatively straightforward. It is pretty simple trigonometry to find out the force that is resulting from a given gimbal angle in the motor. Fins are a lot more difficult because that side force is dependent on way more factors than with TVC. When you tilt a fin on this rocket, like this, 
The side force that comes from this fin is dependent on the airspeed, the air pressure, a little bit on the air temperature, the angle of attack, and like maybe six other factors. So here's where I started with all of that. I have never done computational fluid dynamics before, which is sometimes referred to as CFD, and this project is already really complicated, so let's just make it more complicated. I started with a basic flat plate chamfered edge fin design. My hope with this was that I would be able to validate my CFD results with regular old hand calcs, which are a lot easier to do, in theory, on a flat plate. This decision is one that I regret deeply and I think about often. I also wanted to validate these CFD results in the real world somehow, and while we didn't have access to a really fancy wind tunnel, you know what I did have access to is a lot of open roads in rural Tennessee. So I mocked up a little fin test jig out of some 3D printed parts, carbon fiber rods, and a load cell. On the edges of the fin test jig, I added quarter 20 hex nuts, which are the same size as most camera tripod mounts. This will make sense in a second. I also added a servo to move the fins, and I set the pivot point just forward of where I believed the center of pressure to be, so that in theory, if the joint on the fin slipped, the fin would fail straight. After getting the device set up, I hooked it up to an AVA computer and wrote a test deflection program, which ran through several deflection angles on the fins and measured the load cell along the way. Before running these tests, I also took the CAD model and I tossed it into SolidWorks FlowSim, which is a pretty basic CFD program. I did this to come up with an estimate beforehand of what the side loads on the fins would be. I ran all the CFD with the current air temperature and air pressure on that day, but what the CFD does not account for is the shape of my wind tunnel. This is a good time to talk about the point of these tests. The world is your wind tunnel, and you can use it to validate lots of different simulation results. The goal with these tests isn't to get crazy accurate data, it's to find out if our CFD is somewhere in the ballpark and how big those errors are. I mounted this thing on the hood of my car using DSLR camera suction mounts, each rated to hold about 15 pounds. The air pressure and air speed around this hood will be slightly different than if we stuck the whole assembly out like a meter or two above the car. But again, we aren't looking for accuracy we're just looking to see if we're in the ballpark. So let's go do that. And by the way, here's the way that this is working. There is a switch right here so that when I hit this toggle switch, um, we start the sequence on Ava. 50 miles an hour, here we go. And 50, running. Still good, that's I think the last deflection right there. Straight, test end. Cool, so that's that. I can also, I love that I can hear the drag of the devices on my car. Like, there is a noticeable difference here. Back on the highway, heading home now. So this like totally worked and like I'll have to check the data and make sure that things look okay. But uh, I don't know, everything went really smoothly. I didn't have any electronics problems. Yeah, I don't know. I'm really happy with the test. And as long as the data looks good, that's it. Okay, goodbye. And the data does look good. We'll take a look at just one of the speeds we evaluated to be quick. The load cell was quite noisy in the wind, but it's easy to see where the center of the averages are. When we plot side force against fin deflection, we can see a pretty clear curve. We can also see that around 25 degrees or so, the fin stalls and we can't get any more side force. It actually goes down as we keep rotating. When plotting this data against estimated side loads generated from CFD, the results match with pretty decent accuracy. The higher fin loads from those road tests are probably due to the velocity and pressure being different at the hood of the car, but there could be a lot of different things that are contributing to this, so I'm hesitant to say that for sure. Either way, these results were close enough for us, so armed with this data, we were ready to build out the rest of the hardware vehicle. So the first part of getting this thing to work is simulating how the fins respond on the ground, and the second part of getting this to work is actually flying it. For the first test, I strapped this thing to a drone and wrote some code to command the vehicle to release itself after getting high enough. Then I put a tiny 90 degree roll program in there to see if it matched the simulations for the control system. Oh, so you win some and you lose some, right? 
In terms of the winds, uh, the 90 degree roll program worked great. The control system response looked really close to what we simulated in MATLAB and Simulink beforehand. In terms of the losses, uh, the, the entire vehicle is the loss, I think. I lost most of the onboard footage from that little test, and although the data from AVA was recovered, because I'm getting really good at doing that, the rest of the vehicle was pretty much uh, right off. For the parachutes, I had used this stretchy bungee cord to attach them in the hopes that the bunginess would help reduce the snap load on the parachutes and hopefully prevent us from ripping them. I did not tie the right type of knot on this parachute line. And so the rubber core slipped out, it ripped the nylon and the chutes went off on their way. It's fine though, this is why we test. So armed with this tiny little bit of roll control data, we built a few more vehicles and got ready for a low altitude test flight. This time with these test flights, we're not just going for roll control, we're also going for position control. And this is a whole nother beast. The first thing I'll say about this decision to go to the low altitude test flights, I don't know exactly how we would have done it differently, but we probably should have done some intermediate level flights that weren't quite from so high and involve some position control with a lot lower stakes. And as a second quick note here, I cannot talk uh, a whole lot about the guidance algorithm that we used to steer this vehicle to a point. Um, I don't know if you want to connect the dots yourself, but uh, Mark talks about it a little bit in his video. It just doesn't seem like a great idea to talk about how we guide a really fast moving object to a point on the ground. There's a lot of published math on how to do this. It's not like this is totally novel stuff. Uh, it's just not something that I am gonna spread around that much. What I can talk about is how we went about estimating how this thing works as a lifting body and why it ultimately failed as one. So the whole idea with turning this thing into a lifting body is that we wanna generate side forces, but we don't wanna do it like we would do on the fins. We want side forces on the entire body so that this vehicle doesn't tilt, it just slides. So basically what we're looking for is various angles of attack and fin deflections that the rocket is statically and dynamically stable. So I'm editing this video now and looking through the section where I try to explain what dynamic stability is and realized it's like a 20 minute explanation and that can be condensed down way further. So uh, to make it really simple, dynamic stability is the ability for the rocket to naturally come back to some equilibrium point. Usually if the rocket has fins that are on straight, it will always come back to being upright, but what actually happens in this case with position control is that we tilt the fins a little bit and that natural stability point gives us these side forces that if it's dynamically stable will be consistent. That if is a really big if and it is the assumption that got me in the most trouble with this project. All simulations were run assuming that we would maintain dynamic stability, which was not the case. Lots of things contribute to this not being true for the vehicle we have here. The shape of the fins is a big one that I can think of. These fins are not really built to be super aerodynamically efficient, and especially when they're very straight in the airstream, um, they don't have great responses at those low angles. The body of the rocket also had a lot of little screw heads on it, which cause all sorts of problems downstream. And another thing that can happen with a vehicle that has three or four fins like this is you can get into trouble at high angles of attack with something called body shading. Body shading is when one part of the vehicle is more exposed to the airstream than the other. So if we're traveling down this way and we want to pitch this way, this part of the airframe is going to be way more in the airstream than these fins on the back here. So these fins are not going to be quite as effective. You can think of it too, if you rotate the vehicle about 45 degrees and you wanna control the roll axis, when you move all four fins, this fin is doing almost none of the work because it's totally in like the wake of the body of the vehicle. These are all exaggerated examples, but essentially this is just to say that there's a lot of complexity here. <laughs> Additionally, in some of these low altitude early tests that we did, the limits on fin movement should have been much tighter. While the first flight failed because of a rogue negative sign in a fin movement constraint function, the second flight might have performed much better if we had limited to much smaller fin movements and much slower fin movements. After that second drop, the vehicle waits for a second and then immediately engages roll, pitch, and yaw control all at once, and we did it with fin deflections that were probably constantly stalling. After talking with several aerodynamic control engineers after this from a bunch of various companies and places and instances institutions, we realized that we could probably complete this project. It was probably within our capability, but we didn't quite want to complete it in this way. The current design is one way to do one of these egg drops, but it was going to require a lot more work 
maybe some wind tunnel time and a lot more testing. And there were other ways to get an egg back from 100,000 feet. Mark's video talks a whole lot more about that, so I'll recommend it again. You should check his out in the description. I'm sure it's pretty clear, but this is just barely scratching the surface of how much work went into this project. And I don't really know how to fully encapsulate all of the things that Mark and I went through to make this thing a reality. I wanna say thank you to Mark. Thank you to the balloon team. Thank you to everyone who worked with us on this project. Uh, and thank you to everyone who helped when we reached out needing, you know, advice or guidance. I actually think this project is a pretty good example of making sure that you keep the right questions in your mind when you're trying to solve a problem in engineering. For instance, it would be really tempting to keep working on this fin control thing until we could get it to work and be like, yeah, we finally did it. But there's a project goal and a project deadline in mind, and we live in the real world with all sorts of other constraints. And so making sure that you solve the problem in the right way is important to like think about as you go through a project. So once again, go check out Mark's video. Thank you to everyone for watching this. Uh, and if you're new here, I've got a ton of cool stuff on this channel. Um, I just put out a really interesting video about spinning a camera on a rocket. And uh, thanks a bunch for watching. So my name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds be low.